This is humbling just because I'll go over it again. I'm sure you guys heard, but uh, a tape from here went to Charlotte and really helped grab me and then uh, attended here back in 99. So uh, your ministry works, you know, and I even saw a videotape later and then got a big box of tapes from Michelle. And, uh, and then some of those little pamphlets, those little white pamphlets have stuck with me since 1999. And that's how I stalked Michelle back down on the internet and uh, a maiden name. And uh, Floyd and I have that in common. As far as that, has, that's a little close to my face. I'll drop it down a little. But, uh, but I just, I, it's humbling for me because something, uh, when, when we record stuff, that I'm standing in the place that maybe there's a Darren out there you know, sitting there on a job site, not really connected to a church, maybe had a spiritual experience, but needs a little bit of teaching. Everything we do helps. You know, I, I, I used to get in arguments about spray-painted overpasses where it says Jesus saves. And it's like that stuff pulled me in on my drive to Charlotte. And the legality of it, I don't want to discuss all that, but it's like everything we do when we speak his name, it's, it's very important. So this is awesome to be standing in this place. And uh, but let's pray. Father, we thank you right now. We thank you for the gifts of the Spirit. We thank you for just uh, what your presence is in this earth. And we know Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. And so we ask through your gifts tonight, not gift, but gifts tonight, that you would demonstrate yourself. And uh, just uh, we have what Buddha doesn't have. We have a connection to the heavens, not just a hope. Father, we have everything that the world needs through you. So, Father, let this moment be about that and uh, fulfill some needs tonight and help us get stronger in Jesus' name. Well, as I was sitting there, as the Lord's like, uh, if you have everything planned, why are you praying? So I kept praying, and he, uh, he gave me something, and so I just want to start out with that, and uh, I'll get to my joke that I wanted to tell you later, maybe, or after fellowship or whatever, but tongues. Speaking and praying in tongues, it's, we, we, I don't want to get into the whole exegetical, hermeneutical expounditure upon that, but what I want to do is share experience with that I had a few years ago, 2008-ish. I'm sitting in uh, my, uh, my house in Jacksonville, Florida, and I said, I'm going to pray in tongues for an hour. I'm going to do what these people say to do, and I'm just going to go after it. And I did it, and I looked at the clock. It's 20 minutes. I'm like, okay, I keep going. 30 minutes, 40 minutes, finally got an hour. And right after that, I went onto the computer and looked at pornography. Not joking. I'm, so, I'm sorry I have to say that in here. I wish I'd, I'd been blameless since I saw you. But I feel like this is what God told me. And that was a long time ago. It wasn't yesterday or probably wouldn't be sharing that. I'd be sharing in private and back with the pastor. But I all, what it's done, this is why I feel like the Lord wants to share it. Because I always wondered, I had a doubt planted by the enemy about what did that do good for me. And I start, even though I'd been baptized in the Holy Spirit, even though I prayed in tongues since then, even though I had an experience with it, it made me doubt it, it made me distrust it. I, I did it because that's what you do. But until recently, probably the last year, I've just been like, there's something to this again, and I've been diving back into it just full-heartedly. And I know there's people in here that, you know, did a little stammer or a little stutter at a camp meeting or something like that or a youth meeting or privately in your own room. And then the devil instantly did something to you. And I just got knowledge about this probably two, three weeks ago. When's the best time to beat up a strong man? You kick him in the face right after he comes out of the gym for an hour. I was building up, I was doing all that stuff, and if I would have waited, if I would not have gone straight to the flesh, if I would have relaxed, if I would have went to the spiritual sauna instead of just running right back into the world and allowed that to build me up, that's what God was wanting to do, and Satan just went, boom, and I was like, well, that didn't work. So I just, I feel like that's a word for somebody, that's a word for me, if it's not for you, I'll take it and I'll sow it and I'll grow it and I'll preach it somewhere else and we'll go with it. But think about that. Tongues is so powerful. And, uh, well, I, I, it might lead into the joke. This is awesome. Thank you, Jesus. I grew up believing two things. Mormons were liars and tongues was of the devil. And I still believe one of them. <laughs> and it, it, all jokes aside, it's turned into a glorious thing for me. And I remember Mark, when he was praying with me in his little trailer house, he would speak in tongues. And then he, what do you think about that? Because he was, he was getting new into it. 
But I didn't have a problem with it. The Lord took me through 1 Corinthians before I ever knew who Charles Parham was. He took me through it. He taught me about it. He gave me it as a gift, and I won't go into it all. But it's, it's been a precious thing. So don't, don't let the enemy take it from me. If it's not working, I did one sit-up, and I don't have six-pack abs just yet. I have a one-pack, I think, as I told something. Else. But it, it takes a while. But speaking in tongues is very powerful. And it even says in Isaiah 28, where it talked about it the first time, it says there's rest in it. So I just, I know you guys, you know, are a non-denominational power field church. You know, you believe in the gifts of the Spirit, or I got the wrong room. But hey, it's scripture anyway, so go, you know what I mean? I've, I've talked about this in Baptist churches and stuff, and it's, it's not to get into the depth of the whole thing. I feel like that first part is, is pretty good, but it's a rest for you. It's a rest I've been writing these films, and we're getting some attention. We're talking to Lou Gossett Jr. I've had a script on Mel Gibson desk, blah, 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 all day long, and I give God glory for that because we're trying to reach people like that. But when the, the Baptist folks down in Jacksonville, they, they're pulled to my story, and they're just standing there like, what kind of thing is this? And I said it started because I started speaking in tongues. Because I started being faithful with my tongue, I began to be faithful in my private time. God starts downloading this stuff. And I always wondered, how did it, Jeremiah or Ezekiel write this stuff down? Four horses and a lion's head and this and that and this, a twirl and this. And he went to the east and he went to the west and it was cherubim here, green here, this way, that way. How did they write all this stuff down? Your spirit is a lot bigger than you know. There's a, there's a verse, there's a, a passage where, where Paul is saying, I want you to be filled and then after that, he says, continually filled. I don't know if you've ever filled something, but you fill it, and that's it, not your spirit. It can expand, and God can put things in there, and he, he can also take them away. If I get out I got 27 films I do, I'm going to go out to Hollywood, forget about God. He'll just pull my hard drive, and I'll be in the middle of the room going, because they're connected to him and his plan, but he can expand that spirit. And it started with speaking in tongues. And when I lay hands on these people, I pray for them and I ask God to stir that up. Because it's the tripping points, faithful in the little things. They say, well, it's the least of the gifts. Well, if you can't get over the least, if you can't believe that someone can come to you, the Bible actually says it's a sign to the unbeliever. And I think they get it just a little bit wrong. It's a sign. I came to your house, I did a demonstrated God, and it was a sign to you that you won't believe in God no matter what he does for you if you can't believe that God can just get a hold of a tongue. And then you go into it, what's the unforgivable sin? Blasphemy. Speaking of that which is holy as if it's evil. So growing up thinking tongues is evil, isn't it holy? So it's a big deal. And when I preach this in uh, uh, Assembly of God Church in the Dominican Republic, People began to see what they had. And so it's like, okay, you already have it. You got the yogurt, and it has the fruit in it. Stir it up. And this is coming out of stirring it up. So that, that's just good stuff right there. It's, uh, it's not full. I started speaking in a new Japanese tongue on the drive up here. It was so ridiculously awesome. And I was just laughing, and then God was like giving me well, the words that I was saying, and I was thinking about it. He says, you get two sheep, and then you get four sheep, and then six sheep out of that, and then 12 sheep. And that's all I was saying in some Japanese dialect. But man, it was just pouring into me, and it was awesome. And then my car broke down, got to pray for a guy with a heart condition, just all kinds of whack stuff. My friend Floyd came and got me. It's like, man, what if I wouldn't have done that? I feel like there's people standing at the bottom of the ocean in this room, in this world, that are like trying to hold their breath, and there's a tube hanging down, and it's like, I don't want to look silly with that tube in my mouth, and there's oxygen flowing out of it. How long are you going to hold on? How long are you going to hold on in your trials until you just breathe? And the Bible says it's a refreshing song. Uh, Isaiah 28, it's a refreshing It's a time of refreshing, but they would not receive it. It actually says... Very well then, with a foreign lips and strange tongue, God will speak to this people to whom he said, this is a resting place. Let the weary rest and this is the place of response, but they would not listen. Get all Max Licato's books and all the stuff you want to and just read, 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 but until it comes alive in you and you stand on that, that's where all this stuff comes from. And that's, that's why God is taking me where faithful in that. 
write a song about your girlfriend and go big like Chuck Berry or whatever you want to do or just get something deep and start it now. Start digging your well. Be faithful. If you know two syllables in tongues, you do that. And I'll, I'll go ahead and share the dream that I had. My, my grandparents were, were predominantly South Southern Baptist, and I had this dream one night, and I was riding this, this Clydesdale. It was like a, a Percheron or something like that, and I was riding it, and zombies came, and I thought, how cool, man. You never see this in a zombie movie, man. Get on a, a Belgian horse and just ride through them. And so the first zombie that came up, he just went like this. He, and the horse died, and I'm like, what? And so I look around, and the zombie's coming at me, and this is a crazy dream, but it was cool for me, and it's cool for you if you stick around to the end. But what happened was I looked around, and you know those old, uh, uh, what is it, uh, the, the barrels that were by the door where you put your uh, umbrella? I looked, and there was an axe handle, and I'm like, sweet axe. So I grab it, and I whip it out, and it was like one of those old razors on the end of it. I'm like, he just killed the horse. What's this? And all of a sudden, I'm like, I got it. And so I swung it at the zombie-looking thing, and it killed it. And God said this, he said this, he said, this was your grandpa's mantle, the horse, all strong and big, and he was good in the community, he was a deacon, he was a lay minister, a mighty man of God in his own right, converted from Mormonism, done all these things, but a very good man, but when it came time to battle the enemy, and you know what that little thing was? You probably already guessed, it was the gift of tongues, it was praying in tongues, it was a little foolish thing. And when I used it, I had victory where my grandpa didn't because he had set that aside or had it preached to him. It's not that he openly rejected it or anything like that. That's just all he knew. And so God added that to me in this process of coming through Charleston, South Carolina in 1999. And the enemies fought against it. So, Makumbarata sakietoroboboko sondrabakata. It's life, it's breath, and I need to breathe it because of where I'm going. I need to not be f fooled that I need that hose at work. You need to pull it out. And you need to breathe before you go into your office. He'll give you witty inventions. We hear all these things, but this is the access to it. So, you guys ready for tonight? <laughs> oh, I got I to do this. The Lord had me make a note here. I work in an RV park down in, in Hannah Park in Jacksonville. You guys have probably been there. It's uh, Mayport, all that stuff. I went to fix a guy's converter, you know, the electric thing that's in there. And I went to fix it for him. And I, I went to help him with it. And I'm telling him everything I know about RVs. I'm like, man, you get the wire here. You can do this. You can go to, uh, uh, what is it, Best Buy. And you can get a fan. And you can replace your fan. You don't need to order one. And I'm just like totally laying out everything that has to do with this converter. And I realized at one point, he looked at me, he's like, well, since you live in yours all this time, you know, all the time, constantly, I guess you need to know this stuff. But I just need a simple answer here. And I realized he only did this on weekends. I live in it all the time. And then I thought about people like Michelle and Floyd. It's like, why are they talking about Jesus all the time? Why are they doing Because they're living in it all the time. There's people that come and go on the weekends like, I don't need all that, Jesus. I don't need, if you're living in it all the time, you learn about it. You feel it out. You become a professional about every little thing, every little emotion. But if you're just coming weekends and take it out of the garage, and it hit me. It was like, this is how people take me all the time. Darren, I just, I just needed a little word, man. I just needed maybe a little encouragement, you know, give me a little bread, bread book, you know, set it on my toilet. I'll read it every once in a while. But you're coming on a little heavy. Because I live in it, and I've learned of it. And I've learned the faults, I've learned the failures of it, but live in your Christianity. Live in your Christianity. And this guy was just like, man, you come on a little strong. And it hit me. I was like, wow, that's how I've been taken all my life. So, Jesus, help. Mormon and a Scientologist walking down the street. Here it goes. This is really good. They're walking down the street. They run into each other. They start witnessing to each other over the top of each other. The Mormon's saying all his stuff. The Scientologist is saying all his stuff. And then all of a sudden, the Mormon being a nice guy, he says, hey, 
Let, let's flip a coin and like take a turn here. Mormon wins the coin toss, so he says, man, you can have a nice family, you can have space babies, you can take over planets. And Scientologists, I, I know we just flipped a coin, but let me cut in right there, talking about space babies taking over planet. Lord Zeno has already taken it all over, and we're just a, an apparition from his inner spirit, and we're these space babies already, and he's the Lord of the universe, so you don't even have to waste your time. And the Mormon's like, that sounds awesome. So they go take a step and go back to the Scientology unit and they get about three steps and the Scientologist turns around and says, wait a minute, you got any money? That's just kind of a, a picture. I, I had to get that one in there. I'm sorry. But we're living in a present reality. When they say what I hope, when people say, well, at least if I hoped in this and it doesn't work out, at least I lived a good life. Let me tell you something. It is substance of things hoped for. It's substance. You are connected to the right hand of God, and it is substance. It's a reality. Jesus never left his church. He hooked his church up. He went outside like an RV, and he plugged in the 50 amp, and boom, everything came on in the church, and you came up from the grave. Peter came up into his office, and it all happened right then. Oh, Jesus went away, and we got a rule book now. Let's just follow it. Do you think that's what converted Peter? Do you think that's what pulled Peter up? Do you know that was the first time in the Bible it says Peter stood with the eleven. Before it was always Peter, Peter running out, doing everything. He stood with the eleven. It, it literally erected the church like a pop-up book. It turned the page and boom, everybody was in place. And when you get saved and placed in that, boom, you have an office. So this, this mumbo-jumbo and all this stuff about heaven and promises, and it's just a trick. If it's not Christ, it won't get you there. Not just because I believe it. So, let's go to Luke chapter 19, verse 10, and talk about my friend Zacchaeus that I brought up the other day. It's, uh, it's a verse that all evangelists, all uh, people like that, and we're, uh, <laughs> it's awesome. I love the verse. Luke 19, verse 10, and I'll turn there with you. My Bible kind of automatically goes to that page. You ever have one of those verses that you just stick on? 2 Samuel 7, the Lord just kept giving to me that for like, I don't know, like 12 years. And just kept reading it, kept reading it, and one day it's just like, wow, that's, that's awesome. So stick with stuff, you know, don't go flying all over the place. If the Lord holds you down, he wants you to see something in it. But it says this, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. And I underlined here, you know, being, being a good uh, prep preparation time, you know, with all this stuff. I didn't have my computer with me, and I just felt like this is kind of a mission trip. We're just kind of going with what's available and rocking with it, and the Holy Spirit can do that. You know, Smith Wigglesworth didn't have a Greek lexicon on his computer, and he was fine. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm just trusting in the Holy Spirit that this is what's for you guys, and this is why I'm here right now. But it says, seek and to save the lost. Look for, redeem what is being misused. He's, a, he's like a financial advisor. That's what's going on here. He came into Zacchaeus' life. And what, what's on my heart tonight is a lot of stuff, but it says it's more than just a confession. It's a response. My wife, at certain times, we grow distance, and I still say I love you when we go to bed. You know, sometimes you look down and I love you. Sometimes you look right at him and just kind of say it. And other times, I, I, I love you. There's a response that goes with it. And there's not just a confession. And so, when did Zacchaeus, and I don't want to get into doctrinal stuff or anything like that, but when did Zacchaeus ever get down on his knees and say, Jesus, you are Lord, you're a king, you're... It was his response that qualified him. And then he, he was, but um, hold with me. Let's go to Psalm 50. This is, I love when you see what Jesus did and then it was like written about in the Old Testament and it was confirmed through just one individual that it was reality and it was sound doctrine. If someone would have followed him closely, they would have saw that he was fulfilling these things. And so Psalm 50, the very last verse, it's awesome. Verse 23, if you have the same Bible, Psalm 50, verse 23, and this is a version since I do have a computer and I do go through this stuff. One version says this. He says, He who puts his house in order, I will show the salvation of God. 
when I read that, I thought instantly of Zacchaeus. He who orders his way aright, prepares his house. What did Zacchaeus do as soon as, what happens when you get a king dignitary in the house? Hey, hey, sweetie, grab the best stuff. Move that, do, get that out of here. Do this and that. That's what Zacchaeus was doing. He's like, I'm going to give you half to the poor. I'm going to repay fourth of this. He started making things right because he knew Jesus was in the house. And so all these things is to seek and to save the lost. What was Zacchaeus before? He was just going to work. He found an angle. He was a chief tax collector. He was at the top of his game. He was on the all-star team. He was at the Fortune 500. He was the guy, and he was at the top of his game. He was very wealthy, the Bible said, but unless he was fooled, Jesus came into his life, and he set things in order. And so what, what are we doing as far as just a confession? Have we set our house in order and said, okay, Jesus, I've got all this money, but this is what it's really for? Because I'll tell you what, just a confession isn't enough. We can do this on the weekends. We can say these things. We can do this stuff. It's like, I, I like the fact that everything that I'm wearing is provided for me. My glasses have a story. My shoes have a story. My pants have a story. My shirt has a, a story. And it's getting a little, the glitter's falling off. It's like one of those signs where it's not blinking anymore. But I'm telling you, it's like everything when you get your house in order, when Jesus comes back, when he comes back, you don't have to do that last minute. And so all this stuff, it's not just a confession, but he came to seek and to save you. So you, you increase in stuff. So you do good things. Let's go to Psalm 50, verse 15. Let's find out what this is really about. Are you saying I have to be perfect, that I have to have all the right DVDs in my thing? Well, let, let the Lord speak to you about that. But what I'm saying is, this is the key right here. Psalm 50, verse 15. I'm a pretty jacked up dude sometimes. But the day Jesus came into my life, did I or did I not respond properly is why I am saved or I'm not. And it says, and call on me in a day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall honor and glorify me. That sounds like an awesome plan. Does it say you will have a successful business, you will dominate everything, you will win MVPs and trophies and you will do all this stuff. And then at the end of it, people will be like, look at the mighty God. He took over every realm of business, Hollywood, all that. No, it says, call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall honor and glorify me. What did Jonah do? Well, he called out, didn't he? He vowed, he says, I will pay what I vowed. And with a voice of thanksgiving, I will pay what I vow. And immediately the fish spat him out. So he understood the covenant, but the verse right after that says, but let the wicked not speak of this. You want to continue to be wicked, and then you say you serve the Lord, you serve the Lord. It's not about wicked being imperfect and us being perfect. It's we know this. We can speak of the covenant. Well, you're not perfect, but I know when I call on the Lord, I shall be saved. That's not even a one-time thing if we want to get into that, but I'm just saying it's a continual thing. You know the phone number to the fire department. If your house burns down, you call them and you, you get on the line quick. You've been introduced to a God that saves people out of many troubles, all the trials of the righteous. The Lord delivers them out of them all. This is what we're talking about. This is what Zacchaeus did. And what did the people say when he went to stay with them? That he went in to be a guest of a sinner. Well, that sinner sure responded correctly. And this sinner hopefully responded quick, correctly. What are you going to do? When you come in, are you better than your friends? Are you better than everybody else? Are you trying to set it in order? Jesus knows our hearts. So anyway, he came to find you. He came to say you're misusing everything in your life. And if you would respond correctly, it will not be lost. And he only took half of what he had. The other rich guy is like, I need everything on you because your heart's a little different. But Zacchaeus responded. So where are you at right now? What's going on with the world? Where am I at? I don't even know. I, I did see the address outside. But Psalm 50, isn't that crazy that in Psalm 50, how much of a sinner was Zacchaeus? Do you think he might have known this verse? He, he didn't know it was just by grace and all those things that Paul was going to write later. All he knew was like, well, 
if I'm going to know salvation, if I'm going to know something about this guy that his name was salvation, Jesus and Yahshua and all these things that he's walking through town and I'm going to know about him, he comes into my house. What happens when you get around drunk people on the streets or something like that and they're totally inebriated and you start telling them you're a minister? They start saying the Lord's Prayer. They start doing whatever they can. I think we need to respond to that a little different. They're sitting there. Oh, it's like, oh, I'm sorry. They drop the blank and they do this and they, they say this and that and they respond to the holiness in us. And all they'd have to do is kind of just set things in order. Well, you're talking about work salvation now. No, I'm talking about a proper response to something that is holy. A proper response. Lay down on the streets and just bow before a king. That's getting something in order. And we do little skits where Jesus knocks on the door and we, you know, and all that stuff. But it's, it's going to happen. And that's, that's what I wrote here. It says how you respond, how we respond is everything. Jesus. I love Zacchaeus, man. I love the fact that I'm learning this now, and it was, it's not, it's, I, do you guys ever go through a burning service where you take everything that's, you know, might be an idol in your life and you throw it in a barrel and you say prayers. We did that at Bible school and I chucked all my Michael Jordan stuff. <laughs> and later on I was like, oh man, that was, that was kind of crazy. Because <laughs> it, it felt a little bit forced, but now. So let's go into the seeking to save the lost thing. And I don't have a diagram, but you guys could see. No, there's a little circle. It's called the earth. It's going to die and pass away. Everything on it. Your, your successful business, your nice garden out in your yard or whatever you have. And lest we, we start looking into that a little bit, Jesus comes in and tells us, that, hey, keep planting stuff, keep doing your business, keep doing whatever, but just make sure that it's like it's not going to go down with a ship. And I always see two ships. Let's say Titanic and another ship pulls up, Bob jumps off it and he's saying to you, hey, this ship's going down. It's like, yeah, but I really enjoy the dinner right now. Look at that chandelier. And we start saying things like that and talk like that. And it's like it's going down. The ship is going down. It says in John 3, 17 that he came to save the world, not condemn it. It's the only salvation for the world because it's going down. And so what it is, is seeking to save the lost. Unless you think that it's all about this world. And what do we say? Oh, a ball game won't hurt us. Going here won't hurt us. A little bit of candy here. A little bit of this. A little bit of that. If you find out about what the investment is. And I was thinking of Enron versus, uh, what's a good one? Uh, what's the Amazon? Enron versus Amazon. Let's see who invested in Amazon and who invested in, in Enron. You guys remember Enron, the one that just tanked? So all Jesus does is says, hey, man, you're putting in something that's just going to tank on you. But I know Amazon stock's going to rise in the next 15 years or something, so I'm just an inside trader. That's all Jesus is doing here. And I'll tell you what, this is a personal conviction of mine. That's why I live in my RV all the time, and that's why I'm a freak, and I freak people out all the time. Well, some people all the time, but uh, some people not all the time, some of the time for some. Anyway, with the RV is that I, I want to go all in. Why do you live just across the street? Why do you get into the Word every day? Why, why do you not go anywhere until the Lord tells you to go anywhere? Why, 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 why? Insider trading. Why does it say those who understand it produce a crop? That understanding means... They value it. They've got the full picture on it, and they don't want anything else coming in because it's life. So that response is everything. You're given an altar call. I remember you asked uh, almost everybody here if they were Christians, and it sounds like I'm preaching a salvation message. Guess what I am? Your little ticket that you went to the show in 1971 doesn't validate your response today. I was going to do this the other day, and since, since uh, evangelists can kind of say things and do things, you know, the pastor probably, you know, either get nervous or he'll really like it. Either one, you can't really win.
But what I'm saying is, like, what if we said right now, and I talked to Floyd about this, and he already gave me the right responses, like, okay, everybody's paychecks right now, all the deeds to your house, all the deeds to your car, all the deeds to your tractor, everything else, your 401k, all the promises to your children, all that stuff, don't do anything, but bring it here and sign it over to uh, Shield of Faith Church, and then we'll just go from there. Instantly, like, ooh, just got a little tight in here. But you know what salvation and lordship means? I'm, I'm the fool for studying this out because now I'm responsible for it. But it's literally power of attorney. What's a power of attorney? When you're inebriated, remember the day you got saved? Not many of us are wise, not many of us are noble, right? I guess you were walking on top of everything and just ready to rock and roll and you just wanted to get saved one day. No, chances are you were inebriated and you can't handle your bills, you couldn't handle your house payment, you couldn't handle your relationship, you couldn't handle anything. And you signed a piece of paper over to the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. I've been calling it power of eternity because you've got to turn it over. Why would I take that back? That's good for Facebook stuff, you know, those little quotes. But that's what I'm saying is like, it's like, okay, we set our house in order one time. And I'm not telling you to really do that. Respond to the Lord and do all that stuff. Keep doing what he's telling you to do like Zacchaeus did. Because he didn't say give everything to Zacchaeus like he did the other rich guy. He asked him to respond with his heart. So he asked me for everything in 1999. Everything. 10% would kind of be kind of nice sometimes. Just give 10%. But my RV, it was a gift. It was a witness to a guy. Someone gave it to us. Someone gave us $250 the other week. I wanted to go get a red box. I went ahead and did it with the wrong card that God told me not to do that. Dollar twenty-eight. I felt convicted. I signed power of eternity, attorney over to Jesus Christ. So would that be a lot easier to do what I said about bringing all your, your house and all that stuff? That's proper response. So I, I just, I wanted some friends up here, but what I'm saying is respond correctly. Put your house in order and act and believe as if it's, you're putting it onto the ship. And what some people do is they, they make a show of it or they do it for some reason. They put all their money into eternal things, into church things. And then it's like the, the boat goes floating off and they don't get on it themselves. What happened with the rich man is a guy came up to you and he says, go sell everything you have, give to the poor and come follow me. Now let me explain this for you. Fast forward it just a little bit. Peter said, hey, we left everything. Da, da. And he says, anybody who follows everything, you guys will rule and, and reign on the tri tribes of Israel and the 12 thrones, but anybody will receive a hundredfold. Now let's back up just a little bit. A certain rich man came up to him. Jesus said, give up everything that you have and come follow me. Follow me where? To the kingdom. Where does the money go when you give to the poor? It goes into the kingdom. So back up just a little bit or go forward whichever way. I'm kind of scrambled up and so are you, but let's stick with this. A hundredfold of a rich guy's stuff. What's a rich man worth to you? A million dollars back in the day? Ten million? Five billion? What's a hundred times five billion? Jesus was saying... Give me your stuff, invest it into something eternal, and then follow me and I'll take you to your reward. And he's like, you, you don't believe in eternity. You're good at this world system and you lot made a lot of money, but you don't believe in eternity. I asked you to invest in it and then come with me to take part in it. And Peter's like, I left everything. What am I going to get? He actually asked that. So I'm in a new stage, and I'm just sharing with you where I'm at, but I'm in a new stage where it's like, Darren, it's just not about this world, but you can actually invest in the next kingdom. You can actually have a position in the next kingdom. And I'll tell you this parable. It's, it's a fresh one, and you can, you can run with it. It's not copyrighted or anything like that. You can produce it. But there's a guy doing a business deal. He's a real estate in, in and he found a, a really sweet piece of property across uh, near Charlotte, just across the border, right? And he's working it out, and there's this old lady that's the, the sole proprietor of the business that owns it and all these things. And she, 
she's getting sick, so she's missing his calls, and he's in, he's in Walmart grabbing something. He's got a fat po- pocket full of money. He's getting into his B&W, all that stuff, and he's heading out the door, and he bumps into a poor guy, and the poor guy's like, you just got a dollar. And the guy's like on the phone, he's like, what, what do you even bought? He doesn't even pay him attention. He just goes on, he's just like, what are you doing? I got to work this deal. I got to work this deal. Well, the, the lady dies. So it puts the deal on hold. And what they're waiting for is her nephew is the only sole surviving heir to it all. And they can't find him. Because he went through a spell of time in his life. He kind of got down on his luck. He went homeless. They don't know where he's at. So the deal's kind of off. The guy's not thinking anything about that guy. But when he walks into the meeting, finally they find the guy. They clean him up. They put him in the office. And they say, you have some business to take care of that this lady had left over. So the guy's like on the phone, he's got his wallet, he's all these things, he walks into the meeting, who's sitting there? The guy that he could have gave a dollar to. And now, check this out, how much do you think he would have had to give for that land, no matter how much it's worth from a guy who had nothing, that just inherited everything? How much money do you, do you think he would have got a really good deal on that land? He might have gave it for free, he might have got it for a dollar. But you know how much money it would take to get that dollar? Because that guy reminded hey, when I needed a dollar, you didn't even do that. The deal might be off. Now picture eternity. You're, you're getting a little serious now, Darren. Think about this. You have a moment to invest in eternity. And you're too busy in your life and you miss a dollar for a poor guy. Do you really believe in eternity? Or do you start to see poor people, broken people as an investment? Well, you shouldn't have to be motivated like that. No, I'm just being real. You do get a blessing. You do get a reward. And what it is, is a check of your heart. If you want to invest in my business, well, I really believe in that, Darren. Good luck with you. Or give me a million dollars. You really believe in it? You really invest in it? God gives us opportunities, whether we will give up our time, whether we will give up our money in little moments, that when we walk into eternity, we invested in it and we belong there. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Put... um, Let me get this thing straight here. There we go, I got it. Colossians chapter, I'll get it directly. Chapter 1, verse 18. You know, the Bible says that we're heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus Christ. And I I think about the things that we consider so valuable, but they're not eternal. So God is not asking us to give something that's eternal. Eternal. But he's going to give us something that's eternal. Everything that belongs to Jesus Christ belongs to us. And those are eternal things that we will inherit from God. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Everything that God has, he's given to his children. Now think about that. Floyd, when you pass away and, 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 you, and uh, Michelle passes away, who gets all your things? All your stuff. Stuff. Your children, you know. Your children. Your children gets it all. And God gives us all. He's blessed us with all spiritual things. Blessings in heavenly places. And I want to read this scripture. Uh, It's up on the board. Look at it. He also is the head of his 
body, which we are, the church. Seeing he is the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, so that he alone in everything and in every respect might occupy the chief place, stand first, and be preeminent in our life. Now that's what he wants. That, that's what he wants. Not for selfish purposes. Because I can't even walk <laughs> without him holding my hand. And if you don't put him first, and if I don't put him first, we'll fall on our faces. Boy, if I could sing, I'd sing that. When you, when you can see that he is not selfish, that he is a giver, and he wants to give all of his children blessings. When you read the scriptures uh, in uh, Corinthians, I just love it. I was reading this the other day uh, to Michelle, I think it was, and see if I can find it here. Because we look at it, we look at it in the natural. But see, I'm, I'm right with, uh, with our brother there that everything I have belongs to the Lord. And believe me, I've been tested on it. I've been tested. It has not, it's just, I mean, it's, we give up our nice brick home over there in Meadowcliff Ave. It didn't matter. Lord, just to do your will. <clears throat> I don't know if he really wants, but he wants you to be released from it. Because if we're not careful, everything we have can be a God. And we can be practicing adult, idolatry and not know it. Do you have anything that you love so well that you wouldn't give up? It reminds me of the little story. The little girl wanted this little trinket, this little bracelet. And uh, so it was in the 10 cent store. So the daddy buys it for her. And she just loved that little 10 cent bracelet. It was so pretty. Look at it. Isn't it wonderful? Look at it, Dave. Isn't that, isn't that pretty? Oh, isn't that pretty? And the father would have prayer every night with a young girl. His daughter was about six years old. Honey, he said, do you love your bracelet more than me? And she said, no. She said, well, then let me have it. Oh, I couldn't do that, Daddy. I love this bracelet. So... Her daddy said, well, good night, honey. Had prayer with her. Next evening, came back, same thing. Honey, you love that bracelet? Oh, I love this bracelet. Why don't you give me that bracelet? Oh, I couldn't do that. I got this at the 10 cent store. So the, about the fifth night, he said, do you love it more than me? And she said, no, I love you more. And so she gave the 10 cent bracelet to her daddy. And he reached in his pocket and pulled out one that cost $500 and put it on her little arm and says now that's from your heavenly father all these things that we think and we're not saying go out and sell your house and how many know what we're talking about here tonight it's it's from the heart we're talking about in our heart it all belongs to god and in god's heart it all belongs to us and you read the scriptures and you'll see that 
even these troubles that we have, uh, which I'm going to read right here in, uh, if I can find it for me, 2 Corinthians, yeah. Here we go. All right. <clears throat> for how about this one? You can put it on the board. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. Now don't fall out your seat when you read this. For our light momentary affliction, this slight distress of the passing hour is ever more and more abundantly preparing and producing and achieving for us an everlasting weight of glory. Even the, the, the afflictions that we have to suffer down here, the, the disappointments, the, this little passing hour, which is but a vapor, is achieving for the children of God an everlasting weight of glory beyond all measure, excessively surpassing all comparison and all calculation, a vast and transcendent glory, blessedness never to cease. Oh my goodness, can we see that? Powerful. Do you believe that? So we're not going to end up on the short end. When God told and spoke to Susan and me to sell our home, buy this land, we didn't have the money. We, did, we, we obeyed God. When God says, build a pulpit in your house, we did that. Took all the furniture out of our front room and our dining room, got rid of it all, and put 70 chairs in there, and let the people of God come in and turn our house upside down. And God said to Susan, loveth these, reminds me of something that Peter, the Lord said to Peter, loveth thy these more than me? See, we're talking about spiritual things here, and there's a spiritual place that we can, uh, that God wants to bring us where we're free from it all. <clears throat> Amen. I don't want to get too deep in here, but uh, I, I uh, I have given thousands and thousands of dollars. I remember one time somebody asked me for fifty dollars in my heart. Just why? Why don't you go to work and find, get it yourself? And I can give thousands because God's worked it in my heart. And some of you know, you've been blessed. It doesn't bother you, because see, the Lord's going to take care of me. I'm 82 years old, and I can testify that the Lord will take care of you. And when you can get all that fear out of your life and the bondage and everything, and you're just free to love Him, free to be used by God any way He chooses. Oh, man, preeminent in our lives. That means first place. Now, you know, I'm talk we're talk God's talking to some folks here tonight. We all know that. He's talking to me. He's talking to, to uh, Darren. He's talking to all of us. As long as the little girl held on to that 10-cent Cadillac, God couldn't give her anything else. See, you have to open your hand. And release what you got where the Lord can put a $500 bracelet in your hand. And all these things that we're going through. Boy, I've seen in my lifetime men have tried to become, the, oh my goodness, I, getting into the church. I want to become first deacon. I want to become this. I, I'm going to control the church. I'm this and I'm that. Striving, all that striving. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Almost hated to go to deacon meetings. It's more like a demon meeting. So you're talking to somebody who's been around here. But I thank God that God has brought forth a people here. And you're not a selfish people. 
You're a giving people. As long as we hold on to it, it's just like unforgiveness. God can't forgive us unless we forgive others. That's a principle all through the scriptures. I sure like to have this forgiveness, oh God. Then forgive. What you give is what you receive. Give it up. Give it up. It ain't worth holding on to that. Give it up. And you see, the way it works is, Jesus was the highest place. Philippians 2. We all know that, don't we? And he, he came all the way down, gave up his everything in heaven, you know, I know he suffered on that cross, but I believe he suffered when he was separated from the Father and had to leave home to come down here and, whew, and take, on the, take on flesh. He humbled himself even unto death. And some of our brothers overseas right now in Syria and Iraq are having their heads cut off, being shot. Because they're Christians. But see, when you've already given it all to God, send me to heaven and do me a favor. It's hard for our natural mind to understand that because Paul brought the same thing up in the Scriptures. As far as I'm concerned, it's, it's gain for, for me just to die, to get out of here. Gain? Paul, what are you talking about gain? Yeah, gain. I'll be there with the Lord. But for your sakes. As far as I'm concerned, I'm ready right now, but I tell Susan, for her sake and you guys, I want to stay around a little longer because some of you are moving really good in the Spirit, and I want to see you come to that place to come into the fullness of Jesus Christ. That is my desire as a man of God, that we'll be so free in God that the power of God will ricochet off the walls in this place. But long as me is in the equator, some folks, I, me, and myself, some of the good counsel sessions we have is to get people to give up me. God don't want your boat. He don't want my tractor. He don't need it. You know what he wants? You and me. All of you. He wants to be preeminent because he knows if he's not, we, how many of you know we'll goof up? We'll goof up. But when he's preeminent, how can I, how can I all these years, two minutes, I still got you for two minutes, all these years, 50 Eight, six, I can't remember, 57 years. I've walked with God on the front line. I've been on the front line all these years. And God's kept me by the power of God. I had chances of committing more adultery than you can imagine. I could have done more fornications. Let's tell it like it is, you know. That's what our brother did. But because I put Christ preeminent, because I could see the glory, I could see the glory of God, that was outshine every ugly thing that this world may give us. I've learned when my flesh wants that, it was dealt with at Calvary 2,000 years ago. I don't have to obey it. Sin shall not have dominion over us. It's not that you're not going to have these feelings. You're going to have every feeling in the book. Because this flesh desires this, that, this and that, that, 24-7. But you've got to know how to 
put it in its place. Just think of the cross. It was at the cross that God set me free and set you free. Oh, the imaginations of your mind, the evil thoughts, the thoughts that came into your mind, if we were all uh, uh, really would be braver to stand up and say, well, let me tell you some of the thoughts that went into my mind. Would you like to share? Would you like to share that? Some of the thoughts that went in our, who wants to share some of the thoughts that went in your mind? Huh? Anybody over here? Huh? You wouldn't scare me. I said you wouldn't scare me. I know what type of thoughts go through your mind because we're all from the same stock. I like what Michelle says. Flesh is flesh. and It doesn't matter whose bones it's on. It's flesh. But I can tell you this. The, it is God working in us, making us willing to do his good pleasure. And God has worked in much of our hearts. And I have no ought against no man. I love everybody. How can you say that, Bob? Because that's what the Lord has done. How holy are you, Bobby? That's me, Bobby. If a good-looking girl walked across the stage with no clothes on, I wouldn't look at her, would you? Would you? I know you women wouldn't. See, we're made a certain way. The flesh is made a certain way, and it functions a certain way, and you've got to understand that and, and say, thank you, Jesus. Yeah, you took care of my sins, but you took care of this flesh 2,000 years ago. Hallelujah. It's done. It's finished. It's complete. So let him be preeminent. Now, we're talking about responding. What do you feel like responding tonight to? What has the Holy Spirit said to you tonight? You want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost? You want the gift of the tongues to be more uh, fluent in your life? Come up and let us pray for you. Or you just want to sit there and say, I'm satisfied. Well, that's good. I am satisfied with Jesus. But the question comes to me, is the master satisfied with me? Now, this is not to put us to, to, to shame. Respond to the message. Respond to the Lord. Respond to the Holy Spirit. What do you feel like responding to? Nothing or something? You want us to pray, our brother? It's going to the altar. He feels like praying because the message touched his heart. The, the altar is open. Young folks, you're our leaders. Just think, it'll all be on your shoulders one day if Jesus tarries. That's right. So what's on your heart tonight? Do you need to come for prayer? We'll wait. Just a little bit. We'll wait. If not, fine. If you just still respond to the Lord right where you're at. Respond. Respond. Yes, Lord, thou knowest. It's not about condemnation. Forget about that. No, it's about he doesn't have all my heart. That's one thing I know about Susan. I got all of her heart. And she's got all my heart. How many wives in here want a husband that doesn't have all of you in his heart? Think about that or vice versa. Because that's the trouble with the world today. That's why about 50% of Christian people get in divorces. Susan belongs to me. 100% on the, on the natural plane. Now, Christ is preeminent in her life. And I belong to her. 
That's why I have survived as a man of God all these years and have not fallen off the cliff. Because I've been tempted from everything you can imagine. But because of God's grace and mercy, I've been able to stand and my record is clean. Why? Because a long time ago, I made Jesus Christ preeminent in my life. Preeminent in my life. And I know some of you have. And here's what I think I, the Lord is saying. Nail it down afresh. I'm bringing to you remembrance now. Nail it down. This is so important. So important. That the devil think you are half and half. You are giving him all the opportunity to suck you right in to his deception. Are you understand what I'm saying here? Well, I give the Lord half. Well, then the Lord has uh, the responsibility to keep half of you safe. How many of you understand what I'm saying? But when you totally surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender except my ice cream. Hello? Oh, I could never give up that little 10 cent trinklet that I got at the 10 cent store. Well, God wants to give us something better, and he is going to do it. He is doing it. Amen? <laughs> Glory to God. All right. I, uh, every heart's clear. Brother, we love you. Appreciate that good word. Amen? Tell the brother you appreciate it. <laughs> God bless you now.